All right, uh, let's, go, let's get the show going. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, second of six Sophie and Alex Rosner seminars in health, history, and social justice. Uh, we're really excited to welcome another incredible speaker less than a week after the, our first one, and that is soon to be House Representative Corey Bush uh, from the First District of Missouri and St. Louis. Uh, soon to be Representative elect, it all sounds like a mouthful, so we're just going to call you Representative Bush. Uh, uh, it's quicker, and that's what you're going to be soon. Um, we'll say much more about Representative Bush in just one second, um, but as always, we want to first just acknowledge everybody who makes this work behind the scenes. Uh, Simon Mack for helping us with Zoom, Sadie Bergen, a brilliant PhD student who also helps with a lot of logistics, uh, Isra Allison and Stephanie Herndon from the uh, Bush campaign, uh, Andrea Con Constantio and Yasmin Davis for helping us with promotion, and of course Chris Noble uh, from Brand New Congress uh, who helped us put uh, get in touch with uh, Representative Bush in the first place. And as always, we'll have this on YouTube later as well. And I got one more person I'm going to introduce a second after Representative Bush, and that's uh, Karina uh, Carrillo. Carrillo. Um, she's an environmental health sciences student, a second year at Mailman. Uh, more about Karina uh, in just a bit and why she's here as well. Um, but first, as we do at the top of these lectures, we also like to explain who they're named after. Uh, Sophie and Alex Rosner were the parents of David Rosner, one of our faculty. Sophie was a school teacher. Alex was the editor of a community newspaper for New York City's working class Hungarian population. And much like Representative Bush, they were unabashed supporters of the rights of workers, civil rights, anti-racist activists. And they paid a price for that because this was during the period of McCarthyism. Alex Rosner was actually called before the House Un-American Activities Committee. And so when we pick speakers for this series, we really are looking for people who kind of carry on their traditions. Um, they can't just say what's wrong with society. They have to be doing things uh, to actually change society. And Representative Bush met those qualifications just really easily. Like, what can I say about her? I mean, this has been a pretty trying six months, six months for all of us. We have a pandemic. We have a federal government that doesn't seem to care much about solving it. We have reminders of police brutality and racism, one of the worst economies since the Great Depression. That's just a lot of misery. And one of the few times I think many of us smiled was when we saw a wave of progressive upstart candidates with races at, the both, at both the local and state level winning. But the crown, I think, at the very top of all those victories was Cori Bush. Uh, she ran and she won a very hard race in the Democratic primary against an incumbent who came from a political dynasty that had occupied that seat for decades. Uh, she centered her campaign on economic inequality and racial justice at a time when both have never been more pronounced. And it came after two previous hard fought campaigns in 2016 and 2018, uh, one of them for this same seat. And it also came after a lot of personal duress for Representative Bush uh, personally. She contracted COVID actually during this campaign. Uh, Representative Bush, she wears just so many hats. She's a registered nurse a pastor, and especially since the murder of Michael Brown by a Ferguson, Missouri police officer in 2014, she has been a major participant, a leader in the movement for black lives and the larger campaign against police brutality. She's an organizer around issues that affect her constituents, housing insecurity, living wage. She was a surrogate for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and she's an outspoken proponent of Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. And she is a movie star. Uh, she appeared in a movie many of us have seen called Knock Down the House, uh, which chronicled four women who were running insurgent campaigns for Congress. Uh, it's on Netflix and is actually now free to watch on YouTube. 
Uh, the format for this is going to be really simple, but with a little twist. Uh, we're going to just jump right into a conversation with Representative Bush for about 30 minutes. And then for the remaining 25 minutes or so, uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, just type it into this uh, Q&A box at any point, and you can start now. And if you want to read it on video, just type you know, the word video after your question, and we'll flip your mic and camera on. Otherwise, we'll just read the question. Uh, but the twist is that I'm going to be joined by Karina. Uh, Karina is an incredible second year student in the Environmental Health Sciences Department. And she is focused on environmental justice and racism, environmental racism during her time here, among many other issues. Uh, but I thought she'd be great to join because she's also planning to run sometime in the next few years for political office, inspired uh, by people like Representative Bush. Um, she's actually currently a participant in an initiative called Dare to Run, which identifies and prepares women who are interested in running for office and teaches them the ins and outs of that process. So, you know, we said, why not bring somebody who is on a political path similar to Representative Bush's? Couldn't think of anybody better. So uh, without further delay, I want you to imagine Representative Bush uh, in, in our usual kind of setting, a chorus of applause, and then I'm gonna hand it over to my co-host, uh, Karina, to kick things off. Awesome. Thanks, Merlin. Um, so we're going to start off with um, a question um, that hopefully we can get to know you a little bit better. Um, so folks tend to question my own interest in politics and my intent to run when I know my background in environmental health sciences, my age, or the fact that I come from a working class Latino family. Um, as as a nurse and organizer, you represent an individual part of the new wave of legislators from non-traditional backgrounds. And I'm hoping you can share a little bit more about how these non-traditional elements drove your career in advocacy, organizing, and policy. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you all for having me. Thank you for this invitation. You know, I love to be able to share, um, especially um, with our students around the country, just making sure that um, you know that you're being seen, that you're being heard, um, and then that helps to inform everything that I need to do once I'm go once I go to Congress. So, um, and thank you for your question. Uh, so, realizing that all of those things that you just named is is what makes you amazing. Like that's what makes you amazing because there are people like you that are looking for someone to speak for them and not speak, you know, as, as if they don't have a voice, but listening to them and then being able to be vulnerable enough or loud enough, you know, unapologetic enough to speak directly to those issues the way that they um, would like to. So that's what makes you amazing and you have to hold on to that. That is the way that I have ran every single campaign and even before that just that's the type of nurse I was that's the type of pastor I was that's the type of um of activist that I am you know I am someone who I, I I don't care if you see me as less than I don't care if you think my braids are unprofessional or if you think my skin is too dark or you know you don't like my african-american vernacular english or you don't like you know all of these things I I don't care, you know, because there are people in this country, there are people in my district, in my community who identify this way and have felt underrepresented for so long. And so I, I'll say that just being able to be myself, being my true authentic self and not holding back um, worried about hurting, especially when we talk about patriarchy, you know, white supremacy and everything, all of those structures, you know, feeling like I used to feel like I had to like tone it down because you don't want to hurt white people's feelings. You know, you don't want to make them feel like you're, you know, too, too black, you know, and all of that. Done, I, I'm done with that. Like I stopped that a long time ago because we cannot get to true liberation while we're tiptoeing around um, structures that have oppressed us for so long, you know, until people know exactly what you're going through and what you're and, and, and how that has affected you, your community, your family, we can get to a place of healing and to a place of, of, uh, of equality that goes through the door of equity, you know, so uh, so that's why you have to be exactly who, what you just said, you be that person, but every single, all of those different labels that you just, that you just named, 
be the best in each and every one of those because with that comes accountability, responsibility, it comes, saving lives comes as, as a part of that. So what I had to do was, you know, educate myself in those things. So when people say, you know, that, um, you know, I don't come from this family background, you know, even though my last name is Bush, <laughs> I don't come from that family background. So, you know, I had to educate myself in, um, in uh, you know, understanding who Corey is and then understanding who, what so many people that I've been around, what they what they're going through to be able to articulate that and stand up for people. I wanted to follow up on uh, Karina's question because um, one of the things that was so compelling about your campaign is that you really kind of embraced, as you said, who you were. And one of the major facets of you is that you're a nurse, and as a nurse, yes. you've you know, you've experienced the good and rewarding parts, but also some of the really bad parts of the mm -hmm. American healthcare system, how unequal it can be, how exclusionary it can be. Uh, as we said, you contracted COVID yourself recently. So you had a real uh, up close look at the impacts. And we were just wondering how that firsthand experience as a nurse all these years and on the front lines up to the present really, informs your support for things like Medicare for all and other policies? You know, so before nursing, I was a low wage worker. I worked in early childhood for um, over more than 10 years. And I remember um, getting 10 cents uh, 10 cents a year merit raises. Like we was, we were happy if we got the 10 cent, you know, and that was basically the point merit, you know, wasn't just an automatic thing. Um, so after almost 10 years, I left that job, made that particular job at $9 an hour, and I was the assistant director. Um, and I just couldn't live that way anymore. I was uninsured. Uh, so just going through everything that came along with that, you know, when we think about what happens to someone who is uninsured, first of all, I didn't deserve to be uninsured. I didn't deserve to not be able to go to, to see a doctor, you know, when I needed it or my, you know, um, but it meant that when I had a toothache, I had to go to an emergency room. It meant that anything that was going on and, and I had to go, um, well, I knew walking in, I would have this huge bill and I was already low wage. So how was I going to pay it so that I knew that that meant it would attack my credit, which would have, because in, in, I started to learn very quickly how poverty is expensive. Um, and so when I made the decision to go into nursing, I remember, um, you know, getting into nursing school is not an easy task, um, at least in some areas. And, you know, I, I, I um, was accepted into school. I had to give up my apartment. I'll never forget. I had to give up my apartment because I couldn't afford to um, to go to school full time and to um, work and have, you know, take care of my children. I was a single parent. And, but I had to make the decision to take an eviction so that I could go to school so that I could do better later. Um, and so once I did, you know, and I became a nurse, uh, you know, I remember now I'm a nurse and um, I can pay for health care, but I was seeing my patients. Now I'm, now I'm on the other side and I'm seeing patients who need care, who don't have the money for care. And am I going to be the same person that other people were to me? And I couldn't, I couldn't continue, I couldn't work like that. I couldn't, there was this issue within me where I couldn't stop taking care of people because they couldn't, they didn't have the ability to pay. One thing that was really striking for me was that there were levels when people talk about, oh, we need a public option. We need this or we, you know, it, it, I, I, I cannot be a, a, an advocate for this public option thing because one thing that I've seen, you know, there's this class to our healthcare system as well. So I remember working in places where there was a drawer uh, and, and special equipment for those that, had, that were uninsured. There was a drawer for people, for, for medication for people who, were, who had Medicaid and a drawer for those who were insured. Why is the same medicine in three different drawers but, but it's for three different groups. Why isn't there just, you know, and if and people have said to me, oh, well, it's about lot numbers and who pays for it. I'm not, we're, we're, America, we are not that, you know, we're not that, uh, you know, <laughs> I think that we're better than that to understand how to, how to, uh, you know, how to document a lot number. So, um, so I don't buy that. 
Uh, so that was one of the issues that I had. I remember needing to do, uh, having doctors who were, who were so stressed out about wanting to give this particular medicine or wanting to do this intervention, this procedure for this person, and they knew that they couldn't afford it. So they had to go with something else that they knew wasn't what the patient needed, just to at least give them something. That's why I fight for Medicare for all, because I know what that's like. Even when I went through my sickness, I was sick from March 24th up until like a few days, uh, um, some like I think the end of May, um, uh, two full months I was ill with this with these COVID symptoms and just sick. Like I thought I was wasn't going to make it. Like several several days, hospitalized twice. I don't have health insurance, so I went through that without health insurance and you know every hospitalization, all the medication, you know. And so right now I have that. Um, I have those bills to deal with. That is not okay in a society where we are supposed to be the greatest nation in the world. This is, when when I have, I've sat with Congress in Argentina, I've talked with people in the UK and they've said to me, especially in Argentina, the, the people in Argentina, they sat with me and they said, we don't understand. And they, this, these are their words. We are a third world country. I'm like, oh, we don't call you that. But anyway, they said we are a third world country and we have health care for every single person, free health care. We don't understand why America, if you all are so great, why you don't. Thank you. Um, the next question is something you kind of touched upon already at the beginning, um, but in Knock Down the House, um, which featured, you know, portions of your 2018 campaign, you spoke to the importance of staying true to who you are, um, including, you know, your looks, the way you dress, the way you speak. Um, and Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, has also spoken to this and continues to wear, you know, her hoop earrings and the red lipstick despite um, pressure and criticism from her peers. And I'm hoping that you can speak more to the challenges that women, and especially women of color, um, you know, face in regards to dress and appearance and the pressure that exists, you know, to conform, especially in, you know, on the Hill. Yes. Um, so good question. You know, it, it, it is an everyday decision. You know, every day I have to be intentional about the message that I want to send. You should see when I travel, like I have so much, you know, I, I travel with huge suitcases and it's simply because I have the day of, I may not know what the message is, you know, the, the day before I may not know what the message is for that day. So I bring all of these extra clothes. And, and some of that is because, uh, so like with my campaign, people used to say, you know, oh, her campaign is so unprofessional. They wear t-shirts all the time. And, you know, we had our Corey Bush t-shirts. I was branding myself. I knew exactly what I was doing. I was branding. I didn't care that you are supposed to do all of your campaigning in a, a dress or a suit. People used to tell me, you know, oh, uh, yeah, this was an actual, this was something someone told me. I'll never forget. Um, this was back in my 2018 race. Well, 2016 and then 2018. It was that I needed to wear pantsuits like Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, they would tell me that I couldn't wear a skirt, I couldn't wear a dress because my hips are too big. And, you know, so people, you know, it was, that was a distraction for people. Uh, I remember even one day, so I was trying to understand it all. You know, I was still really new to running for office. I was trying to understand, you know, and there was just so much criticism coming. And so I remember I said, okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I can wear pants, you know. And so I was wearing pants and then someone even, and then we got started getting these, this, this, uh, all of this criticism about the color of pants I was wearing. Oh, the khaki pants are just too much. She's too big. You know, th when that happened, that's when I realized, you know what? No, I'm going to be me. So whatever I feel like wearing in this moment, that's what I'm going to wear. And so I said, I don't care if you think my hips are too big because there are people in my district who I would represent whose hips are the same as mine or bigger, you know? And so, no, you are going to get this. And as a matter of fact, these hips will go to Congress and, and help me legislate. So that's how I, you know, that's how I feel. Um, and, but there was there was also a part of me that felt like I need to also pull in this piece of feeling uh, where people feel like you have to look a certain way to be respected. And so we're wearing t-shirts as part of my campaign. And, uh, and I made people understand and respect, you know, because there's this respectability thing. But like when I think about when people um, have said, oh, you know, like this um, black man was murdered. 
well, what was he doing? What type of person was he? Well, he was this, oh, well, he was this. And so we, we need to highlight he was this kind of a person and you shouldn't have, some, this bad thing shouldn't have happened to him. No, I don't care if he was unemployed, if he was formerly incarcerated, sleeping on the street, that thing shouldn't have happened to him. Um, and so anyway, so that I'm very intentional about that. And so the same way with, a, with Alex um, and when, with so many others, like being who you are, helps to break down these systems that say we have to conform and we have to assimilate into what someone else's idea of, uh, of you know, what an elected or what a politician or what a uh, whatever, what a business person or whatever it is looks like, you know, no, you know, and the other thing is, um, you know, am I speaking to who uh, is looking to me? Am I speaking to them? So what is going to speak to that person that's looking to me for help or that person that's looking up to me as an example or those youth that's coming up after me, you know, am I speaking to them clearly? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I remember at one point there was like a whole news a news cycle about my hips. Um, I had some celebrities comment on it. It was just a huge thing, you know, um, and now, I, you know, I look at that as, you know, an accomplishment, you know, because now, you know, if you know other women that look like me, they can they feel more comfortable dressing how they want to dress in politics. This is sort of related um, um, to Karina's question and this whole topic of the strategy you chose um, for your campaign. But one of the things that I think makes you such a natural is you really understand in a way not all candidates do the power of having a personal story and a narrative, and it really makes the issues that you care about and that you advocate for three-dimensional. They don't just feel like things on a piece of paper. Uh, you've, as you said, felt housing security. You know what having crushing student loan debt feels like. And I was wondering just what's the thinking behind presenting yourself that way and making Cori Bush the person and her life story a central part of the message, not just kind of this bio thing that you get out of the way, but you know, this yeah. was a really core part of the campaign alongside the issues. Because, you know, my life was a lot of hurt. It was just so much hurt. It was hurt after hurt after hurt. And I could, you know, I, f it was like, do I deserve to go through all of these things that I'm going through and all the struggle, you know, that I'm, that I have to live through when it seems like things are getting better. And then I take 10 steps back or it just, that just kept happening over and over. And I just, I got to the point to where I was like, is, is, does all of these things add up to something that equals Corey is just a bad person and she deserves this. Like, and so I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And I would look at friends or people that I knew that were going through similar things and how they kept having the same issue. Um, and, you know, I, I remember after um, sexual assault, I went through um, some really serious situations in, in my late teens, early twenties. And I just, I, it was like, oh, well, this is because of the way that you're dressed. I remember saying, you know, it was because I wore, wore the short shorts and it was because I would go hang out at these certain places with these people, with these particular people. Um, and I started, so I, I took that in as my own, but it wasn't until later when somebody kept speaking into my life saying, no, you can do, you're going to do great things with your life. You know, just hold on, you know, um, let me help you. When someone reached out and helped me um, and to start to see things differently, that's when um, I started to use my voice and I would tell people, I started to speak out about the um, sexual assaults that I went through. I spoke out about the domestic violence where I almost lost my life at the hands of a partner. Um, I started to speak out and I saw that when I would speak out, other people that I didn't even know were going through those situations would then say like, oh, that's happening to me. And, oh, this is how, how did you, well, what happened? Um, and I started to see change in other people's lives just because I was speaking out. So now, you know, I realized it, um, the only way, uh, especially once after Michael Brown was murdered, 
you know, I remember saying, my, you know, as a youth, I would never be in, go into politics. My dad's been in politics for most of my life. And I said, because he was such a great person and so much corruption was around him and he would go through so many horrible things. I remember saying I would never do that. But after Michael Brown was murdered, you know, and I saw how many of our elected officials that were supposed to represent us, that were actually paid to represent that area, weren't showing up for us. But there was the regular everyday people that were putting their lives and livelihood on the line. You know, I realized, you know, Know what when someone asked me to run first I said no but then I realized I'm willing to be vulnerable for my community I'm willing to to, to share my ish you know, I'm willing to talk about the things I've gone through so that we can see change because it seems like the people that are in these positions, they don't have that. And if they do have that lived experience, they don't tap into it at all because we keep hurting. You've been, people have, you've been in this seat for 20 years, you know, like I, that's how I looked at it this time. You've been there for 20 years and all the things that I've gone through, I've gone through in my life while you were in the seat, meaning that you didn't do anything about those things for so long. Um, and I cannot sit back and allow somebody else to, to go through those things if I can stop it in any way. I saw in Ferguson how, how just by us being vocal and being diligent, being persistent, put, applying pressure, how that brought about change in our country and around the world. So that was, that's, that was my thinking even as I was running for office is if I could be diligent and be clear about my message and speak up about the core, the root of the things that we are facing very clearly, then we could then we could bring about change and people will feel represented. Thank you so much. Um, so you spoke to this a little early also. <laughs> um, you know, this is the third time that you've run for an elected official position. Um, and I'm hoping you can, you know, talk to us a little bit about the differences between each of the campaigns, um, why you think you won 2020. And lastly, um, you know, how soon after the 2018 campaign did you know you wanted to run again? Okay, uh, so my very first race, um, so it was right after Ferguson, you know, we protested more than 400 days and um, in the, at the, near the end of that run of, um, of 2015, I remember meeting, well, not meeting, seeing Bernie Sanders speak in person for the very first time. And at that time, you know, Ferguson activists, we were called terrorists. We were still called terrorists. We were, you know, um, the scum of the earth is the way that, you know, it was played up and played out in the media. Um, and to hear this man, this white man, and um, you know, this older white man on this, uh, public, very public platform, speak and say Black Lives Matter, it floored me. I was just outdone. Um, and so I began to follow him and to really pay attention to the things that he was saying as he was running for president at the time. Uh, later on that year, um, after we had um, kind of slowed down a lot of the protests, um, somewhere around September of 2015, uh, someone came to me and asked me to run for a U.S. Senate. And that that um, activist has since been murdered. Um, but he asked me to run for U.S. Senate. I said no. You know, of course, I never do that. Um, but the more I thought about it, that's how I realized that the only way to get the heart of the people that have been out there on, out here on these streets for those 400 days um, that gave up so much to be out here, almost lost their lives being out here, um, lost homes, lost jobs. Um, but then came back again, being brutalized by the police, but then came back again. Um, the only way to get that heart there is to run. So I said, yes, but that race, because even with my dad being in politics for so long, he was in politics on a state, on, on a local level, running for U.S. Senate was a whole different thing. Um, so my very first run, you know, I didn't really know how to raise money, didn't really have much help. Um, it was a kind of just me and a, a few other people that were involved in the movement, just trying to make things work. Um, I was working a full-time job as a nurse. I was the director of a community health clinic. 
in, in um, inner city St. Louis. And so I would work my full time shift and then hop in the car after work. My campaign manager would be outside the door and I would like run down the, the parking lot, changing clothes and hop in the car and we would head to our first place. And so we would travel three to four days a week. Um, no money. It was hard. No money. Didn't know how to raise money. Didn't know how to meet, to get into groups. I remember hearing, you know, oh, tell Cori Bush she can't come to our community. This is a sundown town. She can't come. If she comes, you know. So, but every time they told me I couldn't go anywhere, that's where I wanted to go. I'm like, I just stood before tanks and, you know, rubber bullets and real bullets and so much. You're not going to tell me that I can't come to this town, you know, so I would go to those towns. Um, I remember one day in particular, I went to a town, I gave this speech. Um, we had to walk to the, to the um, event because they, the police wouldn't let our cars through. They tried to block us from entering the town, but we made it to this, this particular location. You know, it was a very, very contentious space. Um, but uh, after I gave my speech, I received a standing ovation. And what they said to me was, you know, um, we'll vote for you because you have moxie. You know, you showed up and, uh, you know, and, the, and, you know, this lady said, you know, I apologize because we just, we had never encountered a Black person in real life before. Only thing we know about Black people is that, you know, what we see on TV, that you're murderers and thugs and, you know, everybody's on welfare. Um, and so I learned at that moment that it was about exposure. Uh, and there was this other lady that walked up to me, this older white lady, she walked up to me and she grabbed me by the hand and she started to rub the back of my hand. And I remember I pulled my hand away and I said, what are you doing? And she said, I just wanted to see if it rubs off. You know, but that it really taught me that we just have to be exposed to one another. Um, I, I didn't get angry in that moment. But anyway, but with so with that race, I saw that even by not winning the seat, I was able to change hearts and change minds um, and to help change Missouri. Uh, because I still do, I still um, have those con those connections today. Um, but we didn't raise money. I was like, you know, oh, if somebody wants to give to make a donation, oh, thank you. You know, that was all I would say at the end of the speech. I didn't raise any money. We didn't raise anything running all over the state. For, so for 2018, I'm like, okay, we're going to do this different. I'm actually going to ask for money. So in 2018, okay, I was, but I was saying, hey, you know, if you could donate three dollars, we appreciate it. Every three, every three dollars counts. If it's seven dollars, thank you so much but I didn't push it. That's all I would say. We raised less than $180,000 that whole race. We didn't get to get on TV. We didn't, it was so much we didn't get to do. It's horrible. Um, uh, plus I was, I was in a car accident. I was off my feet for six weeks. It was just a really rough race. Um, so if for 2020, I said, okay, look, I, I want the money out of pot, the big money out of pot, out of pot of, politics, but we're not there yet. So I need to ask for money, especially after seeing that black women raise the least amount of money and contributions than anybody else on the planet in 2018 that ran for Congress. I said, okay, we got to do this thing differently. So I started saying, look, thank you for the $3. Thank you for the $7. If that's what you can donate, thank you. But for those of you that can donate $500, I need that. If you can donate $50, I need that. And, and and okay, you gave me seven dollars, but you gave this other person five five hundred dollars. Is there is there a reason why you know you felt like I didn't deserve the same? You know, people would be like, oh no, yeah, you can have it. You know, and so they would treat me differently just simply because you know they felt like I just they didn't have to give me that type of money. Um, and uh, and I would say, look, I in order for me to win, I have to get the name out. So I need your help. And so that changed our race tremendously. So I would say the difference in those races, the first time I just this didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to put together a team. The second time we put together a decent team. It was a lot of turnover, but I didn't understand how to raise money. And I didn't really want to. It just felt icky because I'm like, Ugh, you know, I don't, I know I'm poor, <laughs> you know, for the most part. I don't want to, you know, but then the next time I'm like, look, even when I went through the COVID-19 situation, I was like, look, the only way people are like, oh, I don't want to raise money while, you know, while people are going through this. And I'm like, look, we are, we can help better if we're in the seat. So let's just get to the seat, you know, get to the seat. Don't take corporate money, but just get to the seat. And then we can do more for our communities after that. So take the money, ask for the money. If people don't have it, then they don't have it. You thank them and, you know, we appreciate them. But if they got it, we need it. <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, campaigns and this eventual victory um, just this summer, um, on the night of the victory, you gave this uh, amazing speech, and there's a line in it that uh, was just really profound, and it's, uh, this is what you said. You said, an incremental approach isn't going to work any longer. 
a no more incremental approach. And you know, it's really profound because I, I think because of how horrible Trump and the GOP have been on COVID, racism, oh the economy, there, there are people who look at that and they're understandably a little hesitant to also criticize Democrats or even run against Democratic incumbents like you and AOC did. And so when you hear that, what do you think is an effective way to respond to people who say, look, it's, it's not the time to rock the boat too hard. We got to focus on the GOP and we can't make demands that are, are too radical and, and so forth. <laughs> that while we're playing incremental politics, people die. And I didn't go to school and become a nurse uh, to allow people to die. Uh, there was no, you know, class. There was no, you know, nursing 101.2 that said, you know, these are the people that you allow to die in your care, you know? So um, I cannot, like, who comes to my district and says, okay, while we're doing this incremental thing, all of you people, you can die and you people, you, you know, you're the second tier and you people, you know, you're the ones that don't get to die. Like who, who makes that decision? And so there, the, it, it, so we've seen what incremental change can do. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation a couple of days ago with someone in le uh, democratic leadership and they um, I talked to them about why I support Medicare for all and they came back with the oh but you know core you have to understand incremental change and you know the ACA did this and that and it helped all of these people and you know you have to give credit to that you know and I said um, I'm one of those people that was that slipped through the cracks of that I'm one of those people who I wasn't able to do what you say I'm supposed to do with the ACA even though I supported Medicaid expansion in my community and I support the ACA as it is right now because we don't have Medicare for all, but I'm going to 100% push for the Medicare for all because I'm one of those people that fell through the, the cracks. I'm one of those people who had to pay almost $900 a month for my premium, you know, with just me and two kids. How was I surviving when I had to add, pay $900 a month just, just on the premium, you know, not including the $46.50 deductible and the co-pays and all of that. Um, you know, and I said, and also I'm, my patients have died. How do you tell me that it was okay for my patients to die while you're waiting and working on incremental change? What does your incremental change do you look like? Do you have a date? Is there an end date to this? Is there a date that we say we've arrived at that incremental change and now everything is good? Because in the midst of that 60, 000, 60 million people a year die while you're playing with incremental change. And so because it doesn't affect your family members because your people are good, how does it okay that it affects mine? Um, and then the, uh, so that's something that, that I've <laughs> very recently said. Um, and then also I've brought up how even with that incremental change, that change does not work well enough for people who are suffering with chronic and persistent mental illness. That leaves out such a huge group of people, this incremental change, my own patients, you know, I have seen my patients decline because they didn't have access to the medications that they need to remain, to remain mentally healthy. And if you're not mentally healthy, you don't care that there is a razor in your foot, you know, because you're a diabetic and you haven't been taking your medicine, you don't even feel that because you're hearing voices and that's taking over, you know, so, um, and now you have to get your foot, you have to get your foot amputated, um, and then worse, oftentimes they, my patients have died that way, um, and so, um, so I, I, I bring that to them. How do you let people die? Because it means 60 million people. Uh, my friend Amy Valella, her daughter died because she didn't have health care. And she, had a, she, had a, um, she went to the hospital and was refused um, care. Um, uh, and, and I think she was 19 years old. How was that OK? So um, also, when we talk about incremental change, whether it's health care or anything else, you know, how do we fix poverty? when we're waiting on incremental change. When we say $7.25 is enough to pay someone for, um, for an hour of work, you know, when we, when, when, or, or even if it's $10 an hour, the same, the, I feel like the person that is, whether it's somebody stocking shelves, whether it's somebody making, you know, a burger, if you're making my burger that I have to put in my, in my body, 
I want you to have what you need. I want you to be comfortable and to be happy and to be safe, you know, in your home life and while you're working, while you're doing that, because I need to consume that and my children are. If you are stocking the shelves, I want you to have what you need because I want to make sure that while you are stocking those shelves, you are safe and whatever it is you have going on because I need to make sure that I'm getting a quality product and I don't want the, what's on the shelf to be expired by a year and a half because you, we didn't have the people to make sure that that was taken care of. So everybody deserves a quality a, 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 a quality of life um, that is representative of what that flag is supposed to stand for. And um, when we can give money to Space Force, but we can put children in cages, I have a huge problem with that. So don't talk to me about incremental when it means that people hurt. Thank you so much. Um, so this will be the last question before we head to the question mm -hmm. and answer. Um, sure, so uh, President Barack Obama frequently speaks to, uh, you know, this voter disengagement and cynicism that exists, especially in our youth and young adults, um, and the importance of restoring trust between voters and their government. Um, so what role will this new wave of legislators that we're seeing play in encouraging communities to participate and trust in their governments. I know for myself, um, like hearing you speak today is exciting enough. <laughs> um, and I think my favorite line so far is, these hips will make it to Congress. And I just, I mean, I just wanna know how we can keep it going um, and keep encouraging people to know it's their government. Yeah, I think first when, people like you and so many others like you continue to support people like me, you know, uh, that is a way because you're helping to get the word out. You're helping to bring that visibility so that people can see that there, you know, that there are people who will rep, who can represent you that are, you know, like you, b believe like you, look like you, you know, come from where you come from. So I think that that's first, but even for this election coming up, you know, um, I think just like what I was speaking about earlier, uh, um, about not making it so much about party loyalty, you know, we are looking at, and someone, uh, uh, um, a friend of mine, an activist in, um, in St. Louis said this the other day, she said, we're voting co conditions, not candidates, you know, so if you don't, so if you're not, if you don't feel motivated to support a particular candidate, Su support getting behind how to fix those conditions and who is going to be the one to help fix those conditions, um, in, you know, the best, the quickest. Um, that is what we have to look at. Also, uh, you know, uh, seeing people who are willing to be very <laughs> just open, unbought, you know, making sure that people know that there are people like us out there, uh, I think helps too, because even with my race, we were able to get um, over 20,000 people who had never voted before, um, you know, excited, registered to vote, first of all, and excited to actually show up to vote. It's one thing to get people registered. It's another thing for them to show up to vote. That's how we won our race. Um, and so I think that that's the same way. I've even put it out there on, in, in the public uh, media, say, in the national media, saying, hey, you know, tell the Biden campaign, like, they could reach, they should reach out to people like us and say, hey, we're going to put you on a bus and send you around your state or whatever to go talk to people. Why? Because, you know, if we're the ones that people are looking to for motivation and inspiration already, if you can get younger people, you know, that are, that are speaking to issues and not speaking to party loyalty necessarily, because the, people are really hurt by, you know, by a particular name. I Forget the name. How can we best assist you in your, in your situation? You got to look at it like every single, behind every single door, behind every single phone call, there is a soul that has a need or a family that has a need that you can help connect them to. And so if we do it that way, um, but when we talk about what you, are, what you can do, I think that each and every one of you have has some type of a platform, whether it's social media clubs that you're in, groups that you're a part of, um, to be able to go out and affect those groups to, and asking them to go out and affect more if you don't care for the candidates, okay, that's fine. But care about the conditions of the people that you, that you care about and how can we best 
attack those issues. Will it happen with who we have in office right now? Or will it happen if we have completely new leadership? Because we're not just talking about um, who's in the presidency. We're also talking about the cabinet, who is in that administration, who are the other elected officials around the country that are looking to that person for advice and for an, as an example. Um, what is what happens to our governor's races? What happens to um, uh, our uh, congressional races, our U.S. Senate races? How do we get those bills passed that are sitting on the desk of one particular person, over 400 and some odd bills just sitting there that need to be moved, that need to be pushed through so that they can be signed by the president? Um, how do we get that? We get that with um, somebody that cares about who you are. Uh, we're going to go now. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left and we're going to go to some uh, audience Q&A. And if you want to ask a question, just click that uh, Q&A icon at the bottom and type your question. And if you want to appear on video, uh, just type video after. And I think I do have somebody, uh, we do have somebody who wants to appear on video, uh, Win. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I think this will work. Yeah, there you are. Uh, when, if you're there, uh, could you ask your question? Uh, and if not, uh, uh, I'll ask it for you. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. That's terrifying, yes. but all right. <laughs> um, so. You've got no video though. Uh, if that... uh, I don't think it, uh, on our end, um, like on, on the participant end, it doesn't have. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead and ask the question. <laughs> audio is great. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, um, hi, uh, Representative. Um, it's amazing to hear you speak and um, also very surreal to hear you speak at uh, my alma for my master's as well as talking to my former health policy professor. Um, but I love this and am so happy to see you in this series. Um, hearing you speak was honestly very healing for me um, just as um, a policy advocate and an organizer working in this space and just kind of seeing like, oh, wow, good things can happen in 2020. Um, as someone who's been working in this spaces, I'm really happy to see more folks from uh, from like underrepresented backgrounds running for office, um, getting into office. Um, and But I also wanna see more folks in like who are black indigenous and people of color, who are queer, survivors, disabled and more also pursuing and yes. getting work in staffing um, and helping support these pro progressives who are from these backgrounds who are elected because I think that like um, that that's honestly very mysterious uh, to a lot of folks including me sometimes and I guess I'm wondering um, what are some of the ways you see political spaces can encourage diverse and underrepresented folks to pursue roles in um, in elected office, uh, offices as well as campaigning roles, because I know campaigns tend to they can sometimes be places, pathways for those offices as well as just going on to other campaigns. And then secondly, um, what would you say, like just advice-wise um, to folks who want to, like from those backgrounds who want to pursue those roles? Oh, yes, thank you. And, and thank you for asking the question and congrats on your work. <laughs> Um, You're doing amazing so, work and it makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, one thing that we did see with our campaign was that th there weren't very many people locally anyway, um, who, um, were, would, who were able to fill a lot of the roles that we were, um, that we had available. And so, what, especially on the progressive end, so it wasn't just um, being able to work a campaign, it was work a congressional campaign, and it was work um, um, a progressive campaign. Those are two totally different things because you can have um, someone who can work um, a campaign for a black candidate, but they, but in our area, at least it was very heavy, heavily establishment, like minded people. Uh, and so the other part was um, most people had never worked a congressional campaign because we had had the same ca congressperson, the same family for 52 years. Uh, so that, that um, they had no way to really pick up that experience other than going outside of the community. Uh, so what we decided to do as a campaign and we're still putting it you know trying to work on putting it together but we will have an actual a school a training school um for people who um especially for um bipoc um just making sure that 
that lane is there and it's very clear. Like we wanna make sure that you know how to run every aspect of a campaign. Um, and then as far as staffers for our, um, for our congressional offices, you know, that is a hard thing, but we have, we have put it out just saying, hey, we are very, we want to be very intentional about, you know, hiring people um, of color, um, hiring black people and other people of color because we feel like that is an area where it is lacking in congressional offices all across the what, what i've what i've heard is for the most part you know congressional offices are mostly or majority white um and that's we're talking about 535 offices you know so um so we're intentional about looking for and making sure that we um that we pay attention to those resumes also um it, not hiring everybody who has hill experience you know there may be people who are just a brilliant brilliant people but just need that in so we're going to be intentional about that so we're in the hiring process right now but that is the work just making sure that we pay, we're paying attention to it i just don't want people who have the hill experience and and all of that i want because my community is my community is um you know is a predominantly even though it's kind of going away but it's a predominantly african-american district so our office should not be a, a, a office full of all white people, you know, has to be representative of the community. Thank you. Um, I think there's, uh, these are, these are two questions, which I'm going to try to uh, merge. Um, uh, so uh, one, one person asks, uh, the Ferguson and Baltimore protesters at the time were often extremely ignored and even made out to be quote unquote thugs and criminals by, um, by the media and, and the government. And um, six years later, these movements have actually been pushed into the mainstream. Um, what's it been like to see that, to see it go to the mainstream? And then another person asks, um, how do you keep it from disappearing from the mainstream? How do you get people to, you know, six months from now to not just think of it as this flash in the pan that, that happened? How do you keep it, keep the momentum going? Yeah, um, you know, I feel, you know, it, I, I really don't know kind of how I feel about what has happened with the movement right now. I mean, I'm excited that, and as excited is not even the word. I don't know what the word is. I feel, you know, um, I guess better that things, you know, are different than they were back in 2014. You know, people would say Black Lives Matter and it was like, you're one of those people. Like you were, it just put you in this group of people that were basically trying to tear down the government and tear down the United States and, um, you know, make it all about Black people. And, you know, it's just, we wanna be extreme about, you know, um, making it like Black superiority and, it was, was really strange. Um, and now, so to now see it to where people are understanding, oh, that's what they meant. Oh, okay, got it. You know, oh, now we see, you know, uh, so it, I, I feel better that we're there, but we're there six years later. You know, we're there because some people gave of their, because people died, like their Ferguson activists died. We're there because so many people have gone to jail and um, and are suffering from the, from suffering even now from the um, effects of tear gas and, and so many other things. Um, you know, seeing corporations put up these huge Black Lives Matter signs and it being the focus of a lot of conversation is great because we're, it's moving, but that's not the end game. That's not where we want it to be. The fact that people are just now waking up to it, the fact that more people had to to die to get people to pay attention like that is the part that i think that we miss is that people died final death over people lost lives while people were trying to figure out like do i like this or not do it is this like is this cool or is it like is it real is it just black people whining or like you know and pushing it to the back burner but now it's like oh okay now we kind of get it but as we're trying to get it people are still dying so you know i can't even really really be excited about it i'm just kind of waiting to see like what's going to happen with it but in the meantime like moving to the other question uh, i'm going to continue to fight for it i'm going to continue to push you know i haven't been quiet about what i stand for you know often Oftentimes I'll hop on, you know, like one of the national uh, news shows and I'll wear Black Lives Matter t-shirt, you know, and people, people are like, Corey, did you wear a t-shirt? Black Lives Matter. Yes, I did. You know, um, and I'll even do that as a congresswoman, you know, because I'm going to keep it in, in front of people's minds. I'm going to support the Breathe Act and I'm going to work on, on other legislation. 
I'm, if there's a protest happening and I feel I need to be there, I'm going to go show up as the politivist, the, the politician activist. I'm going to show up and stand in the street and be a part of that protest. Like that's how we keep it going. We have to, so as activists on the ground, we need you to push the pressure on the ground to push legislators all in your areas to pay attention to this and to push and move legislation on the federal level. What I can do is push that legislation as well. But if you're pushing your, your local ele your local elected officials and your congressional officials, then I can be working on my level and then we can put enough pressure on them to make them really move some of these things that we are fighting for. Pressure, pressure, pressure is like kind of the, the key, right? Um, that's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is a question that uh, uh, I think is quite appropriate given what happened in California uh, where Karina and I are actually from uh, with the fires. Uh, last um last month um but the person asked uh, what do you think about how do you th think about the connection between the climate catastrophe and public health and do you think we need to more explicitly connect the fight for medicare for all which you've been passionate about and the green new deal which you're also a huge proponent of how do we kind of connect these uh two problems yeah, um, because they do enter, they they do, you know, intersect at a point, you know, we have to um, speak about it from the standpoint of, uh, like I said before, just a quality of life. So in order to have, a, a, you know, the quality of life that the flag claims to, to bring, you know, to have those those rights, we have to make sure that there is clean air and clean water for people. You know, we have to make sure that um, our ecosystem is healthy. We have to uh, um, so we, but when we talk about it, I think that we're looking at it from, uh, for me, I always look, I always look at it from the nursing standpoint of, you know, how in my community, um, you know, children are have, there's this high incidence of childhood asthma and we have this. So when we're sending our kids, we have to take off work to send our kids to, to go to the hospital, you know, to deal with their asthma. So we're taking off work, we're pulling them out of school, um, or from their learning to be able to do that. But then we're also then going back home into the same environment that caused it in the first place. So if we're not dealing with those coal companies, if we're not dealing with the lead, the arsenic, the methane that's floating around in our communities from those companies, if we're not addressing that, then our students and our children will continue to be sick. Uh, we, we can continue to look to look to that to be in our air, to look to um, to hurt our communities. Uh, looking at it like, um, you know, when we talk about um, the we talk about uh, communities that are most directly affected by um, the climate crisis. What work are we doing to make sure that those communities have what they need? What are the adaptive resources that are needed in those communities? And we know that women and children are 14 times as likely to die in environmental disasters. But when we make sure that women and children have the access to the health care that they need, when we make sure that they have the access, so if, if health care isn't an issue for them, and we make sure that not only them, because oftentimes it's the women that are taking care of the elders. So the women are making sure that the elders get out in the flood. The women are making sure, but if our, so if our elders have the, have had access to health care, then we, we're putting them in a better place to be able to even move and do things on their own. Um, so it kind, it kind of all like ties in together. Um, uh, speaking about Medicare for all, looking at it like if people are healthy, if, if people are healthy and we're making sure that our, our world is healthy, then that also helps with um, the workforce. It helps with us being effective and efficient in, in workforce. It helps us to put more, that puts money into the economy when people are healthy and when their conditions are healthy. Uh, when we talk about those fires, like how um, how can we, so for the people that had to go through that, if any, for, for anyone who was physically affected by those fires, I know me personally, that would have been a big deal for me. My lungs are still healing from what I just went through, you know, a few months ago. So if I was in that situation and I didn't have health care, you know, what then happens to the people that are, that, that have to live, that have to live that out. Um, so I think talking about it from the standpoint of everything from the person that has the least in this community. How do we fix it? Looking at the person that has the least. I don't want to talk about other the anybody else. I'm looking at it when we talk, talk about healthcare. We talk about the climate as the person that has the least in this community. What can I do to make them make them have what they need? And then from there, that's how we build. 
Uh, Re Representative Bush, uh, we are out of time. Uh, we could uh, go back and forth, I think, uh, for hours, but we want to thank you for coming here. Um, the people in uh, Missouri are extremely lucky to have you as uh, their representative, but also the people in this country, you're going to join the squad or super squad, and um, we're, you know, I think people are very lucky to have you as an advocate, um, whether they live in Missouri or, or, or elsewhere. And we hope uh, that, you know, when things, uh, when we finally get to the other side of this, that you'll come and visit us uh, in New York City and take a break from, from the Beltway. Uh, we have so much to learn from <laughs> you, I, I think, um, more, more so than you from us. Um, but we hope you'll come and visit us uh, in person. But thank you so much. Um, for, it's so gracious of you to uh, give us some of your time. We know there's a lot of things you're thinking about uh, right now before you take office. Thank you so much. Thank you, Merlin, and thank you all for having me. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs>